Hello and welcome to the EcoCast by Actual Tech Media. Today's topic, harnessing the power of AI and ML to accelerate analytics, the business, and IT operations. Thank you so much for joining us on the EcoCast today. On this event, you'll hear from experts at Faction, Progress, and Trifacta. We've got a great event lined up for you here today. Before we get started, there's just a few things that you should know about the EcoCast. If you haven't been on before, you should know that the EcoCast series was created by Actual Tech Media to help educate IT professionals around the world about the latest and greatest enterprise technology, to help you to learn about these technologies quickly and easily uh, from the comfort of your home or home office, whatever it might be, uh, to get all your questions answered and to you know, maybe win some prizes in the process. Uh, my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'm glad to be your moderator on the event today. Uh, we do uh, have some awesome prizes lining up or lined up for the event today. I'll talk about those here in just a moment, as well as the el eligibility requirements. Uh, but I do want to first call your attention there to the questions pane. Uh, I see many of you have already said hello and good morning and good afternoon from across the United States and around the world. Uh, we welcome your greetings. Uh, we appreciate those. We also want your questions about today's topics and solutions during the event. Um, this event is live, and I'll be taking a live questions and doing live Q&A with our experts, so I need your questions. We even have a best question prize to help encourage those questions. I'll talk about that in just a moment as well. I also have some poll questions for you along the way. You can also socialize the event there in your audience console using the Twitter icon on the bottom of the screen, and the hashtag for the event today, ATM Ecocast, will be automatically appended. You'll find social icons on the top right-hand side of your audience console as well for YouTube, Facebook, and our LinkedIn page. And then finally, in the Handouts tab, you'll find resources hand-selected by today's three expert presenters, so make sure that you check those out as well. On the EcoCast today, the prize lineup is three Amazon $500 gift cards. You must be live in attendance to qualify, and I will be announcing the winners throughout the event. We also, of course, have our best question prizes. This is for three additional Amazon $50 gift cards, one for each of the three sessions on the event today. Of course, you have to ask a question to be eligible for of these prize drawings and meet the actual tech media prize policy, which you can find there in the handouts tab. All prize winners have the option to make a donation to selected charities, and you must submit an IRS form W9 to actual tech media. We'll reach out to you via email after the event. Over the years, the charities that we have supported through the Megacast and Ecocast event series are shown there on the screen. Uh, if you win a prize and you want to donate it to one of these charities, we would love to help you do that. We've done that in partnership with the Gorilla Guide Book Club. You can download free educational books over at gorilla.guide. You'll find a link to that there in the Handouts tab as well. It's a great way to stay up to date on enterprise technology. Put them on your you know, Kindle or iPad, whatever you'd like to do. Um, also, I want to encourage everyone to socialize the event there using the Twitter icon on the bottom of the screen. Also follow Actual Tech Media and me, your moderator, David M. Davis as well, over on Twitter. Uh, subscribe to all the Actual Tech Media channels, YouTube, Facebook, and the 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes podcast store. And as I mentioned, follow us on LinkedIn. The icon is on the top right-hand side there of the screen. At the end of the event today, you'll be automatically redirected to our event referral landing page where you can refer your IT friends or coworkers to Actual Tech Media's online events, like this event you're on right now. And both of you could win an Amazon $300 gift card. Those drawings are held monthly. And of course, uh, you can do that right now, even if you click on the event referral link that's there at the bottom of the screen. That link is clickable. Or in the handouts tab where it says refer a, refer a friend. So uh, we would love for you to share um, hopefully the benefits that you find by attending these events with your IT friends or coworkers. All right, so with that, I'm excited now to introduce you to today's keynote presenter. Welcome to Mr. Scott Becker. Industry expert, a speaker, analyst, 
uh, and uh, all around uh, IT pro, all, all around IT veteran, uh, who's going to talk to us today about AI and ML uh, in in the business and in the IT operations group. Scott, it's great to have you on. Take it away. Thanks, David. Today we're talking about harnessing the power of AI and ML to accelerate analytics, business, and IT operations. In a few minutes, we're going to hear from some companies whose leading-edge solutions help address some of the biggest challenges around artificial intelligence and machine learning. Before we get to that, let's step back and look at some of the major trends and issues surrounding AI and ML right now. So let's start with two charts recently released um, by the big analyst firms. The first one is from IDC, and it's about the explosive growth in artificial intelligence-related spending that they're seeing this year and what they're expecting over the next few years. This chart is from August, and as you can see, AI is big business. IDC is forecasting that by the time this year is over, $342 billion will have been spent worldwide on AI solutions. That's a 15% increase year over year, and they're looking for faster growth next year on the order of 19%. In fact, by 2024, they're projecting that worldwide spending will cross the $500 billion mark. Software spending is by far the largest component of those AI budgets. For reference, what you can see over here on the right is where the software spending is going. The magenta line on top is AI platforms, which is all the cloud and on-premises software dedicated to supporting AI. The orange line underneath it shows AI application development and deploy deployment. So this chart is showing growth rates in both platforms and dev and develop and I'm sorry dev and deployment spending are both projected to be running at growth rates north of 30% soon. The other chart I wanted to look at is another view of the market, this one from Gartner. They put out this graphic in September and it's their hype cycle for artificial intelligence. The goal line in, in this one is that mostly flat line at the far right side of the chart, which Gartner calls the plateau of productivity. As you can see, Gartner has that whole section empty right now. Yet, they're, they're throwing cold water on some use cases, but it's surprisingly bullish as a chart on others. For example, um, general artificial intelligence, that's HAL 9000 kind of stuff, is all the way to the left, and it's flagged as more than 10 years out. Same thing with autonomous vehicles, which are right in the middle, but also a, a yellow triangle on this chart, meaning they're still 10 plus years out. Chatbots, on the other hand, are also in, Cart in Gartner's trough of disillusionment there in the center. Um, but chatbots are marked as a white circle, meaning Gartner expects them to be um, in that plateau of productivity in less than two years. So other technologies that are on the move, according to Gartner in this chart, are intelligent applications, machine learning, data labeling, deep learning, AI cloud services, and edge AI, among, among others. What this tells me is that we're in a fast cycle where in two to three years time, that pl plateau of productivity could be filling up with very useful AI-based technologies. That all suggests that the time is now to be evaluating, testing, and starting proof of concepts with AI technologies. What are some of the challenges for organizations right now in getting ready for that coming boom in AI capabilities? First, uh, thinking about the data they have that could power AI solutions. There are questions about data quality and even debate over quantity. So right now, you've got organizations running algorithms against as many as 200 billion parameters in some cases, your classic big data scenario. But there's also a trend of using so-called small and wide data sets. Second, there are also many architectural considerations. Should you process the data in an on-premises data center or centralized in a cloud platform? Or should you push your AI processing power to the edge? For that matter, when it, when it comes to cloud, another big decision is whether to go all in with a major platform provider or to take a multi-cloud approach. So that's a third consideration, sort of a, a sub-consideration of the second one about overall architecture. Also tied to the architectural consideration is a fourth challenge involving cost considerations around ingestion or egress of, of data based on networking architecture and the bandwidth that's available. 
Fifth and, and finally, organizations are thinking about how to empower their developers in a way that leverages their skill to create AI applications or build AI into applications. That, considers it, that consideration is also ultimately about how those AI applications could empower business users to make better decisions for their organizations. A lot of these issues will be coming up today, uh, along with the highly innovative solutions for addressing them and unlocking the promise of AI. So it should be a great session. David, back to you. All right. Thanks so much, Scott. A really good insight there on using AI and ML in the IT organization and in the business. So thank you for sharing that. I've just brought up our first poll question for everyone out there that says, how do you plan to use AI at your company? And notice that this is a multi-select question here. So feel free to select more than one answer on this. And I will share the results of this poll here with you in just a moment. So you can kind of see how you stack up with your peers who are on the Ecocast today. Um, also notice that the last option there is other uh, because you know there's a lot of different use cases for AI, a lot of possibilities, and it's likely we didn't cover every single possibility there in the, the list of answers. So if you have another use case that you're uh, taking on at your company with AI, I encourage you to drop it in the questions box because I'm honestly curious to learn about that. I'm curious to learn what your use case is, what we missed, and you know what you might be doing out there. So, uh, And I will share that with everyone as well on the event. So I'll give everyone a moment to answer. If you haven't answered these polls before, you just do it right there in the slides window. All right, I'm responding to uh, all the hello and good morning messages as well as uh, reviewing these comments that have been coming in. So thank you for those. Hello to gang out there from Honolulu. Aloha to you. Uh, let's see, Hussein said, uh, we're using AI for predictive analytics. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Randall, if you're not seeing the polls, just push refresh on your web browser and 99% uh, of the time that will resolve it. So many uh, excellent folks out there in the audience saying hello and good morning. Thank you for that. All right, thank you to everyone as well who responded to the poll. Let me go ahead and share the results. And it looks like 50% uh, said intelligent applications, uh, very closely followed by machine learning at 47%, and then kind of an even split across the board between chatbots, data labeling, deep learning, and then 14% have other use cases that weren't listed there. So uh, very interesting to see uh, if you were one of the use cases that weren't, that wasn't covered, you know, drop it in the questions box there, and I'm curious to learn uh, what you're doing with AI and ML at your company. And speaking of which, I just brought up the second of two poll questions here before I introduce you to the first presenter on the Ecocast. The question on the screen here is, what's your time frame for adding new or updating existing AI, ML-related solutions at your company? So you talked about your use case, and now the question is, uh, what's your time frame for taking some sort of action you know, on that use case or a new use case? All right, thank you to everyone who responded to the poll. We do appreciate your feedback. Looks like uh, the vast majority of you are taking some sort of action on AI and ML related projects uh, in the next you know, 12 months. All right, and with that, I'm excited now to introduce you to our first presenter on the Ecocast. Welcome, Mr. Matt Wallace, CTO at Faction. Matt, it's great to have you on. Hey, great to be here. Good morning. Good morning, Matt. Take it away. All right. Well, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I've done some Ecocast first time. I have ever been the first person. So I hope everybody got their coffee this morning. I have a lot of content to share with you in a short time, so I will go fast. But I'll hang out and uh, answer questions in chat, too, if we don't get to them during the presentation. Give you the nickel tour about Faction. Uh, we've been around quite a while. You know, This is actually a pretty dated slide. It's definitely over 300 petabytes now under management, growing really fast. Some great partnerships across the industry, in particular with Dell, where Faction delivers the Dell multi-cloud uh, services. 
And uh, this is one of the reasons why I spend so much time talking to large enterprises about their AI and ML and big data efforts. And I'm going to talk to you about something, you know, some of these things that we've seen come up again and again as enterprises uh, start to leverage cloud in particular, but just in general with their AI, ML, big data efforts. Uh, the first one is collaboration, and I'll say this comes in, in two flavors. One is enterprises begin with some kind of AI or ML effort, and they have a data set, you know, data lake, uh, data warehouse, data lake house. Um, you know, you've heard all the buzzwords. But one of the things they run across is they'll have different teams that are trying to do different things with the data. And at some point, one team wants to use it in one cloud, another wants to use it in another cloud, and they start to have real problems with that. Um, I've had conversations now with probably 40 different chief data officers or lead data scientists in Fortune 500s. And a lot of times this sneaks up on them. And the number of times I've heard about how they've spent an entire quarter moving or copying data in order to enable some other cloud is a real challenge. And the other is collaboration outside the organization. Not strictly speaking AI and ML, but I see this a lot in life sciences, for example, where people are doing genomics research, um, which we have a lot of customers that are doing. And you'll have one organization that has this huge repository of data. They want to collaborate with an outside enterprise that outside enterprise uses a different cloud than the one that they had built into. And so they end up coming to our platform so that they can have full access to their data and have this partner have access <clears throat> without having to move it or make copies, right? Being able to take advantage of innovation across all the clouds, because obviously having a fully managed service that allows you to go and do things, that having to build an entire stack yourself is the way to go. Um, cost, I mean, you know, what we find, of course, is people want to leverage multiple clouds for different reasons. Sometimes they want to copy on-prem in their enterprise data center as well, et cetera. But having multiple copies to enable this is very costly. It's challenging both from the perspective of paying for multiple copies, but also data synchronization, network and egress charges at the cloud level, and so on. And then governance is a real challenge. I'm sure everybody who's actually had to do hands-on work here with data science can attest to the fact that it's really difficult, honestly, to massage the data into the format you need it, ensure that the schemas are applied, uh, make sure that you understand from a metadata perspective, you know, where the data came from, how long you're allowed to keep it, you know, what sort of PII or PHI tags apply to it, what you can and cannot do with it in terms of, you know, compliance and privacy challenges, et cetera. And making more copies amplifies that because most of the solutions that solve for that metadata layer, the governance layer, end up being specific to where you land the data. So simplifying it down to a single copy that you could use everywhere, which is what Faction does, simplifies that governance challenge for you. So I want to talk a little bit about specifically about just how multi-cloud in general, because it's really some of the core value that we add really drives certain AI and ML use cases. And the first thing is, access to innovation. And I'd say, number one, a lot of people are going to the cloud simply because they want to innovate faster. Constraining yourself to the innovation you can get from a single cloud doesn't make a lot of sense. But uh, beyond that, from a pure ML perspective, I included this very interesting graphic where you can see this exponential growth in papers that are talking about ensemble learning. So if you look at something like public cloud image recognition services, video recognition services, that'd be like AWS recognition, Azure Computer Vision, GCP's Vision API. You know, if you think about those things, they have very different things that they specialize in, right? One might do sentiment analysis that tells you if somebody's unhappy or happy. Some might do facial recognition. Some might be better at drawing a bounding box around something. And so if you're building your own model to do things with photos or video, you might want to use one or more of these services to help speed up the training of your model. But you can't hope to match what Google has in terms of, you know, a 300 plus million categorized image set, uh, which is actually 30 times the largest I've seen in any public data set used for research. And that itself was very, very large. So how do you leverage those services across multiple clouds? Really interesting here to be able to take ensemble learning yeah, let me, let me pick it up here because I was just talking about ensemble learning, and I was talking about this idea that you can actually leverage different features that do similar things across multiple clouds with ensemble learning to enhance your training of machine learning models. So thinking about Amazon and AWS recognition, Azure Computer Vision, GCP Vision API, they're all things that do image or video recognition. They can do things like draw bounding boxes, recognize objects, recognize people with faces, uh, do sentiment analysis on the faces, et cetera. Some, you know, video, still images, et cetera. 
The interesting thing is totally different specialties across those. There are some features that you know, Amazon has that Azure doesn't have, Azure has that Google doesn't have, and vice versa all the way around. So if you're building a model yourself that deals with image recognition or video recognition, and you want to enhance the trading data set, the advancements in ensemble learning point to this idea that you can use responses from the public cloud PaaS features as features in your ML model to drive more accuracy in your own model. It's basically leveraging Google and Azure and Amazon's effort in those areas to enhance your own model that can be specialized for your use case. So a really cool kind of idea of using multiple clouds there. Collaboration we talked about, and I, I talked about most of these in the intro slide, but I will say, aside from just helping people within an enterprise, different teams work together, aside from different enterprises, partnering up and working on the same data, which are two things we see with our customer base today, you also have this ability to directly leverage this shared backend to enhance your tool set. And I'm gonna show you a little bit how we did that with Databricks. And so moving on here, I think one of the challenges, of course, is if you start looking at um, surveys, HashiCorp did a great state of cloud, multi-cloud strategy survey, state of cloud strategy survey. And what they found is tons of multi-cloud going on, definitely some challenges with multi-cloud, but the biggest problem people are having, aside from cost and security, which were one and two, the next problem down is this lack of in-house skills. One interesting thing about this is I find when I'm dealing with larger enterprises that they are in multiple clouds. And one of the challenges is not they don't have the skills to go to any cloud. It's that cloud skills tend to be specific to a cloud. Right? Somebody who's an expert in Amazon may not also be an expert in Azure. And for those of us who had to wrestle through the fine-grained details of many clouds, you know, you start to understand that there really is a big difference between what goes on inside of a VPC in AWS and what VNets look like in Azure and the way that you can do things like peering networks together or providing transit in hub and spoke topologies and things varies wildly. And so you close the skill gap partially by allowing people to use the cloud that makes most sense for them rather than kind of forcing them into whatever cloud has been sort of prescribed. Uh, and multi-cloud helps that because now with the data set being accessible to multiple clouds at the same time, it makes it a lot easier. Next, scale. So when it comes to things like model training in particular, being able to drive massive scale for that is a really great idea. So in one particular massive parallel computing effort that Faction had where we had uh, hundreds of GPUs with over a million CUDA cores, basically a seven petaflop supercomputer doing processing. You can see this cluster we have on the right, it's stretched across all three different clouds using spot instances for incredibly low economics. But you'll see that during this kind of experiment, we kept getting different types of errors from the cloud providers where we would run out of capacity or the capacity would be taken away from us suddenly. It's a fantastic way here. And, and tools like Databricks have sliders and, and options that allow you to do things like say, hey, I only want to use spot instances, or I only want to use spot instances above this minimum capacity. Great idea, because it can save you tons of money. Spot instances can be over 60% off what a reserved instance costs you. So incredible savings possible. But in order to have reliability with that, you have to figure out, how do I avoid a run on capacity in my chosen cloud? And the answer is, you know, spread across multiple clouds with that data, and if you can scale across them, not only do you have larger maximum scale, but you have much more reliable scale because you don't see these runs on capacity in every cloud at the same time. So of course, you know, there's a huge advancement going on all the time at the hardware layer, right? NVIDIA is leading a charge in terms of AI and ML processing for sure, but each of the public clouds has an effort around this too. So Amazon has released their Tranium processors, their Inferentia chips, Google has the TPU, um, the TensorFlow processing unit, and uh, really interesting how these things specialize in different workloads. And of course, if you expect to train models at scale for really interesting projects, I mean, some of the biggest things I've seen are um, ADAS systems, uh, you know, autonomous driver assistance systems where they're training on you know, hundreds of petabytes of video to try to teach cars how to drive better. These things have to go through so much data, and so the scale is massive. And being able to take advantage of cloud temporarily during these training boosts is, of course, incredibly valuable. But, of course, you want to have the best place to run that workload, and it's going to vary because every time there's a hardware iteration, it may or may not be the best at a particular workload. And so this unlocks all those clouds without having to move your data. It kind of goes without saying that if your data set is, you know, 
many petabytes, certainly hundreds of petabytes, the impact of data gravity on being able to move that data somewhere else is enormous. So simplified governance and management. And this is one of those places where uh, Faction just really shines versus other solutions that purport to kind of deal with this, uh, this scalable cloud storage model, right? Other than things that are in the cloud, which are obviously inherently not multi-cloud, not only do all the kind of remotely competitive services not do true multi-cloud, that is they are multiple clouds available to different clouds, but not all the clouds at the same time like our product is, but then also we can scale much more massively. And this is just a two petabyte example, but we have the ability to put 60 petabytes into a single volume, single export with a single namespace with multi-protocol access. So imagine being able to store 60 petabytes of data that's simultaneously accessible at one endpoint by NFS, SMB, HDFS, and S3 compatible object protocol. Pretty amazing. And versus the competition, which is absolutely a nightmare to manage because you have to provision 20 plus copies of a service at 60 petabytes, it would be 600 copies of a service. And each of those obviously would then has its own sort of administrative plane, data access plane, and concerns around you know, governance and control and provisioning and billing. So quite an improvement really to simplify things with the way we do things. And here's a high level view of our platform, right? Very simple, we have our product, which is called Cloud Control Volumes. It comes in five flavors like file and object and block. And we're able to tie that through Factions Inter-Network Exchange, which is our patented ultra high speed, ultra low latency network fabric that connects to multiple clouds at the same time. And then optionally, we can tie that in over the WAN in a variety of ways to your on-premises data center. So you can have private connectivity to us. And then of course, it's fully private dedicated connectivity up into these cloud providers as well, but fully managed by Faction. So you're not having to worry about how do I set up BGP routes and how do I provision and where am I going to colo all my network equipment? It's completely part of the service. Here's a closer view. And there's some interesting complexity here. So we have this virtual fabric that customers have their data services sitting on and you have the ability to control through our portal where that's going. So you can extend swim lanes into one or many cloud environments multiple cloud environments in the same cloud. And you can see here, we show two different Amazon VPCs tied in through two different virtual gateways. That could be different teams in your enterprise. It could be your enterprise plus a partner enterprise. We have the ability to split the data services across what we call virtual subfabrics. So taking these virtual fabrics and their full network isolation and having say all of your data services for your enterprise available on one fabric, but then having this other sub fabric that you make available to a partner that only has a tiny subset of data that you wanna share with them. So great example there of how we can use the network layer to be flexible, but also enable that partnership with your partners because they don't have to worry about how they connect to your data because you can do that from Faction's platform. We also have, and this is really critical, and again, something that really nobody else does, we have the ability to run compute pieces. So we call it cloud data processing services, but it's bare metal or VMware compute that you can use to tie in very specific virtual appliances because we find that in the real world, people almost always need something like a Cisco CSR 1000V or an Aviatrix or something to extend some of their more complex networking. Absolutely not required because we can stitch our data service directly into your VPC with absolutely nothing set up on your part. But if you have an established pattern for the thing that you do from a cloud architecture perspective, this gives us the flexibility to tie it into your existing architecture pretty much in any way that you would want to do. So to take this around to ML and talk about a real world use case, this looks a lot like that last diagram, but this is something we set up to integrate Databricks. So in this case, we stood up a Databricks environment in Azure. We stood up a Databricks environment in AWS, two completely different environments that really, they're honestly, one is provisioned to the Azure portal, the other is provisioned directly through Databricks website. So even the control plane and provisioning, completely different. But we were able to take Faction's backend and tie these back into the exact same data set in the code you're gonna see on the next page, which we ran as an example. We took one of their examples about training this wind power production model, and we, we basically added one line of code to set the model and artifact repository to Faction's backend instead of the default Databricks backend, which was object storage in this case. In this event, now we're able to, and if you look closely here, you'll see we're actually training one model in Azure, and it's model version two. And then literally about 20 seconds later, we hit train on the model in Amazon, and it trains model version three. So you see not only are we sharing the same data set, but Azure and Amazon Databricks instances now become aware of training passes that are being done by that tool set 
in the other cloud provider because the model and artifact repository are shared on Faction's backend. And this is the kind of powerful collaboration and unification that becomes possible when leveraging our platform for your backend data. So really just an incredible ability um, to drive uh, unification of data, access to innovation and collaboration across partners. So to sum up, um, we really deliver this incredibly fast path towards multi-cloud outcomes. First of all, you can see here, we deliver lower costs. There's a white paper that you can see. There's a link in the handout that we have given you. But it shows how not only do we provide savings over any given single copy in a single cloud, but then we provide almost a 10 to 1 cost advantage if you need to be multi-cloud. So you take the cost of running the comparable services across all three clouds, literally 89 per point something percent savings. Number two, simplified operations and governance on the larger enterprises I talk to, they often have teams that are thinking about building a project that looks very similar to what Faction does from a service level. Challenge with that, of course, is there's an enormous amount of complexity that starts with procurement, architecture, operations, monitoring, deployment, it goes on and on and on, capacity management. Um, and when that, all that's said and done, you know, you have an outcome, maybe that works if you've done everything correctly, but then also now you have to worry about, can you pass an audit? You know, simplified operations governance on our side means we turn up the service, it works immediately, and you can go to a portal and provision the network swim lanes to suit your use cases, and then you're off to the races. And you have a fully audited, fully managed, fully monitored solution that basically does all of the heavy lifting for you. And obviously, if you're going to go to the cloud because you prefer to spend your time on innovating around your product, your service, your customers, rather than working on infrastructure, it would be unwise to build a multi-cloud architecture on your own infrastructure. Um, and so Faction gives you really the one true multi-cloud option that's in the market now. It's probably worth pausing just to say, and I'm going to go on to this number three here, but I do want to say a lot of people that I talk to are in the challenge because they began with a single cloud because they said, oh, I'm not going to need multi-cloud. And the problem is eventually something drives them to it. And it could be the partnership that they didn't anticipate with a company in another cloud. It could be that M&A activity, they acquired someone or someone acquired them, and suddenly they want to unify those organizations from a data perspective, but they're in different clouds. Sometimes they go to start on a project, they're using their chosen cloud, and then they go, hey, wait a second, it'd be three times as fast to build this if we did it in this other cloud, but how do we move the data? And so I've literally talked to, in the past three months, probably three or four different Fortune 500 organizations that have actually spent one or more quarters sequentially basically burning their entire team's time trying to migrate or copy data or re-architect around this. And so I think the future of optionality is a very big deal here. Even when you take away the immediate multi-cloud access, just the fact that you have the assurance in the future that you're not going to have to wrestle with this is a huge thing. So you can see here, we have optimized our architecture for latency and speed. These are millisecond or less, basically, performances to the cloud. So it's basically like being on the land in your own data center. Everything about our platform, from the physical, logical, and operational aspects of it, has been architected to make it massively scalable and incredibly low latency with our direct connections to the cloud partners. And lastly, you know, Faction actually has been doing multi-cloud. We released our very first MVP multi-cloud product at the end of 2016. You let that settle in. We are almost five years into a multi-cloud journey building and advancing this platform. And really, it's time has come because, you know, the use cases lately have been explosive around this. Anything to do with big data is actually one of our sweet spots because the larger your data set is, the more data gravity impacts you, the harder it becomes to copy or move. And when it comes to it, do you want a partner who has massive experience in doing these cloud integrations and operating a multi-cloud platform? I think you do, right? And we have a bevy of experience, you know, experts on our team, documentation that we can leverage to help our customers succeed in kind of implementing that multi-cloud architecture. So I know I went fast. I hope everybody did have their coffee. I'm really excited to share all this with you guys today. And I hope you do come to the website, check it out, check out some of our other webinars and information because there's just a, a host of information I feel very confident in saying Faction knows a little bit more about multi-cloud now than just about everyone. Uh, hope you enjoyed and I'm looking for questions. Absolutely, yeah. Great presentation, Matt. We do have some questions for you from the audience. While we do that, I'm just going to bring up a poll for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about Faction? And we'll leave that up while we take your questions. So if you have a question, uh, now's the time to get it in. Uh, first question I see out here uh, from Simon, he's asking, 
maybe for a prediction, Matt, of, you know, what areas uh, of the business and IT operations do you see AI uh, impacting or assisting over, you know, the next three to five years if you have your crystal ball? Oh, boy. Um, just about everything I want to say. I mean, I think it's interesting because if you look at the different types of AI and ML, you see them really being used for different purposes, right? So the, the, the use of AI for, say, um, applications that used to be strictly, say, like business intelligence data warehouse applications are changing, right? You have data scientists that are coming in, kind of assisting a business intelligence team and just driving better outcomes. And in terms of things like price controls and, you know, predictions of uh, cost fluctuations and uh, things like inventory controls. Then you get into the machine learning things. This is where things start to get really interesting, right? So even, you know, on our back end, right, a lot of the systems that we have have machine learning algorithms that are applied to them for things like predictive maintenance and predictive failure, right? You want to be able to take this sort of uh, subtle signs and being able to interpret them more broadly to predict when things go wrong. And I think you're going to see Tons of that. I think um, there's probably a, an army of people right now thinking about all of the sort of supply chain challenges you see around COVID because we had a very mature supply chain pre-COVID and it pretty much changed everything in the pandemic. And it was a little bit brittle from my perspective because it was really driven by fixed algorithms that were built with BI and maybe AI platforms. And I think machine learning starts to offer you a lot of tools to maybe do things that are a little more predictive that can start to uh, be a, a little more uh, inclusive of things that you don't normally consider in those things. And then deep learning, of course, is incredible. And this is the kind of things where if you look at like what Google has done with their uh, DeepMind protein folder, right? You're taking something that is computationally intensive that takes millions of CPU hours to do something for a scientist who's waiting and their algorithm is able to chop 80% of that time away by getting very close to a prediction. And the amazing thing about you know deep learning and convolutional neural networks and those types of things, for those who are not super familiar with them, is on one hand, they tend to do, make predictions that are a little like magic. On the other hand, you tend to not know how it is that they're right, right? You can know from the training set that they're doing an accurate prediction. You can apply that predictions to new data, and then you can, of course, check to see if the predictions were maintaining accuracy in line with what you saw from the training set. But a lot of times, no one can tell you why. So a lot of those models become inexplicable because it's buried in that deep learning. But uh, I think that that has the potential to change just about everything from, you know, manufacturing efficiency and yield control to telling you if you're, you know, at risk for cancer or Alzheimer's, you name it. Uh, it's just changing, literally changing the world right now. Uh, drug development's a huge one we see. Tons of our customers are in the life sciences space and doing a lot of things around us in order to improve uh, pharmaceuticals and their development. Great question. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to be one of those things where one day we'll say, how did we come up with new ideas or make decisions without this, you know, before? So uh, very cool. Another question they're asking uh, how does Faction handle security and compliance? Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I did touch on this, too, just in this idea that we have talked to people who have gone out to start building their own platforms. And, you know, one of the things that really stops people in their tracks is this idea that even if they get the job done, and it's usually a pretty heavy lift from an architecture, operations, procurement, et cetera, perspective, you know, compliance comes next. And, I mean, Faction's platform is already type 2 SOC 1, type 2 SOC 2, HIPAA audited, right, as you know, many of our life sciences customers obviously have PHI on there. We have to sign BAAs with them. Uh, we're undergoing our high trust audit right now, which is really the gold standard around these things. Um, you know, we have all of the physical, logical, and operational controls to secure these things. Um, and five years in on the platform, I think we're doing a much better job than folks can do in-house very easily. And we have all these certifications to prove it. Um, you know, we actually have a 15-page document that covers just security and compliance that goes all the way from the public cloud side through kind of a deep dive of the physical and logical layer into the faction platform, but then even covers pages full of faction controls. And I mean, I'll say even that is like an executive summary effectively because our security controls document is 600 pages long, um, which, you know, it's intimidating and it's a ton of work. But on the other hand, you know, obviously this is the type of thing that you want to do if you're going to build a service that holds, you know, hundreds of petabytes of critical data, you want to have absolutely the highest level of assurance for it from a security and compliance perspective. Absolutely. Um, 
It looks like, Matt, I'm afraid we're out of time here in our live Q&A, but there's a lot more uh, technical questions perhaps coming in for you there electronically. Maybe you can get back to those folks. Uh, Matt, it's always great having you on. I le always learn so much when you're here. So thank you for your presentation. Absolutely. I will uh, look at the chat and answer further questions there. Thanks, everybody. Excellent. And thank you to Faction, of course, for supporting the event. Check out the Handouts tab there, and you'll find a resource entitled uh, Leveraging Multi-Cloud Best Practices to Power AI and ML from Faction. So make sure you, that you download that. Uh, actually, it's uh, Matt's slide deck. So there's a lot of great resources in there in PDF form. You can download that and you know, review it more after the event. All right, so thank you to everyone who responded to the poll. I'll leave that up while I announce our first Amazon $500 gift card. This is going to Jessica Torres from Virginia. Congratulations. We'll reach out to deliver that prize, and I'm sure we uh, will be selecting a best question prize winner as well because there's lots of great questions coming in here uh, as well for the Amazon $50 gift card best question prize. And with that, it's now time for our next presenter on today's EcoCast. Welcome J.D. Little, who's a DX strategist at Progress. J.D., are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Thanks for being on. Take it away. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for being here, everybody. It's really great to, uh, to be able to present here in this event. And you've got some really great content that we've already heard. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a... Digital Experience Strategist with Progress Site Finity. And as I'm introducing myself, I'd like to also um, introduce our company. So you may not have heard of Progress, but you've probably heard of some of our products. We're really the software developer, software developer, a trusted provider of some of the best products to develop, deploy, and manage high-impact business applications and digital experiences. And I like to show this slide because our impact on the world is really greater than our, our name recognition. And, um, you know, so if I go, you know, we've been around 40 years. We recently rung the bell at, at the uh, NASDAQ. Um, and I just want to show this, not to go into a lot of detail, but just to show kind of the breadth of, of what our company has done um, through the digital experience stack and, and also some of the complementary management monitoring and, and infrastructure tools. And um, again, I won't go through this in detail, but I wanted to show some of the names and logos that are, are may be familiar to people in this audience, even if you're not familiar with progress itself. So, uh, but we're talking about AI today. And though that touches a lot of the products that we, um, that we work with at, at progress, uh, probably, um, more specifically our native chat with the natural language processing, I'm going to talk today about progress site finity, which is our digital experience platform and the complementary, uh, analytics tool site finity insight. And, um, the reason I'm Taking more of a, uh, uh, we'll understand. I'm talking about the practical aspects of of AI because uh, really of this poll. So last year we asked the, uh, some technology executives think about this stuff a lot. What what AI and ML functionalities would be most critical to enhancing your digital experience? And we're talking about digital experience. And their responses were surprisingly mundane and practical. Um, you know they're they're really looking at, you know, what can we do in terms of workflow and, and how can we optimize the customer journey? They're not looking for robotics, right? Um, so I think, well, what's, a, what's an application of this when, when I'm trying to explain this kind of, um, of functionality to others? And I, I think about spell checkers. And what, right now, um, almost every application you use has a spell checker or does autocorrect. Sometimes it's aggravating, sometimes it's very useful. And, and I tried to get my head around why, um, how that could be done, um, this became a really easy example to talk to managers and others about how, how it works. Because you think about uh, the mistakes that I make, <clears throat> it seems like an infinite number, but it's not. It's a finite number. Uh, in fact, 80% of all typos are just from four common mistakes. Uh, Damro and Levenstein uh, created a couple of algorithms that were um, designed to compare patterns and do pattern recognition. And, and one of the great applications is for the spell checking. And you know, this, the four ways that we make most of our typos are substitution, assertions, deletions, and transpositions of characters. And that's a very finite uh, operation. When you think about um, a, a keywordy keyboard, it's a lot of permutations, but it's not an insurmountable number. In fact, the algorithm itself 
we'll sit on a cocktail napkin. You can see right there the um, the four the four operations. And so what I wanted to uh, to do next was just show you a very very quick demo about how we use Insight to collect customer data and then go into some of the um, deeper applications of that as we use uh, data-driven insights to, to help decision-making. And so, um, before I dive into the, uh, the analytics tool, I wanted to show very quickly this um, Sitefinity Insight built uh, website. This is, was built to demonstrate our digital experience capabilities. Um, Progress Affinity is a multilingual, multi-site, headless capable, and mobile responsive platform. Uh, this particular instance is hosted on Sitefinity Cloud. That's our enterprise platform as a service offering. It us utilizes uh, Azure DevOps services. And, and so this was built to show the, the testing capabilities, the personalization, uh, to read and react to actions of, of users. And we have three personas, really, that this was built, were built into this. So we've got those that are um, food aficionados, those are champions of locally sourced food, and people who are interested in the business end of, of restauranting. And so we use this as an example to show all the things that, that we can do. And I would be collecting data right now uh, based upon someone's reactions, determining which persona they more closely fit in with. The idea is to get a 360-degree view of the customer, track everything that they do from the beginning when they're not known, later on to when they're they become leads and customers. So moving on to Sitefinity Insight, this is our cloud-based SaaS analytics tool. We get a dashboard overview of those activities that, that happen over a period of time. And so conversions or actions and behaviors we define as important, uh, usually business goals. Um, touch points are those interactions that uh, contribute to conversions along the way. Um, so you know, conversions might be filling out that franchise application. Touch points would be, you know, reading a blog about being a franchiser. Visitors are, uh, are, you, are unique visitors. We start tracking them when they're not known. Uh, and then when they are known, we store them as contracts and, and continue to craft a relationship with them digitally. Here's those personas we talked about. There's three of them we use for simplicity, but this, it could be hundreds or thousands of these personas and uh, probably would be. Um, it's just a dashboard view of a heat map. I'll talk more about uplift and touch points are basically an intersection of conversions and touch points to see which of those interactions were, were more useful based upon the, the depth of the, of the color there. So taking a look at, at those personas, we, we spend a lot of time trying to uh, define those personalities of, um, of the personas. But really from a data collection standpoint, personas are really just a grouping of activities that we want our visitors to achieve while they're experiencing our, um, while they're having their digital experience. And you know, the, we collect the topics, word clouds based upon search terms and things that they looked at. Uh, of course, we uh, touch points and conversions, but um, the way that we align people with personas is just through a, a, a point scoring system. And those rules are really easy to set up. So. I can you know, define conditions uh, based upon behaviors or other properties that we either get from our digital experience platform or from any of the integrations that we have. And so, for instance, if I wanted to create a rule based upon somebody's country of origin, I might be uh, connected to a customer data platform through our integration or, or plugins and I'd be able to look at address information and, and, and create a rule based upon somebody's country of origin, perhaps you know, the USA. And in doing that, that rule would be applied and it would help somebody be more closely aligned with you know, perhaps American franchises, right? So uh, to sign a, we assign a point value and we can have those points added or subtracted based upon uh, the completion of that rule. And that's, it's just made to be very simple for uh, marketing folks to, um, to uh, complete, right? And so they can manage, manage their business. And of course, we do... We could do reporting on, on the A-B test and the personalization that's built into the system. But really where AI starts to come in, um, or maybe more properly machine learning, is through these recommendations. And so the, what the recommendations allow us to do is, is predict uh, on optimizations that can have the biggest impact or to increase in conversion rate, you know, the next best experience for the conversions visitor segment. You know, we want to see which visitors are likely to move to the next segment closer to a conversion um, there's a nice FAQ that looks at the website and says, if I want to you know, enact this campaign, I uh, 
you know, I need to make this change or maybe I don't need to make any changes. And so um, this is a way that we can suggest uh, more closely defining those touch points. I'll go into deeper detail uh, about how that's used. But um, effectively, as we're starting to have known entities, we want to understand their journey a little better. So this is Melissa. She's a known entity. Uh, she has a relationship with Coriander Lane. Uh, she's had interactions for um, you know for a month. We um, we're able to pull in some information. Some of this can be imported from from other uh, integrated platforms. But I really want to focus on on her journey. And as you go through this, we can see her interactions over time. And we found out pretty quickly that she was aligned with a with a franchiser persona. Uh, she filled out an application. We assigned points to that, and we started treating her like a franchiser on the website. She was seeing business news. She was seeing financial reports of the, of the, of the comp corporation. Um, and she also is doing other things. She's, you know, she's checking out the restaurant. She's writing reviews. She's uh, you know, talking about us on Facebook. And as she does that, other personas start to kind of come in as well. I mean, she's a food aficionado as well as someone who's interested in business. And so it's just a real quick view of how we, through someone's user journey, read and react, but also collect data. So that's data on an individual. Well, what do we do when we pull all that together over a period of time? Well, every interaction is fed into Sitefinity Insight, regardless of the channel. Uh, and that could be tracked um, as, as representing uh, some activity that we want somebody to complete. Uh, and here's an example of a franchise application as a conversion. Uh, looking at conversion reports, we can see conversion rates and count, informa and, and, and count information for what they've done, um, converting personas, and perhaps most importantly, which touch points they've hit along the way. Now, touch points are uh, engagement points that we, or engagement interactions for visitors, and you define these with a with a, with a specific goal in mind. But for a, a a digital experience platform like Coriander Lane or built on, uh, say, Affinity in a multi-channel environment, you could have uh, uh, 10,000 potential touch points, right? Um, and, and, um, you know, and they may go unnoticed. Uh, in something like Coriander Lane, there might be uh, people coming from different uh, globes. Um, and so, um, you know, discovering customer journeys blind spots is really important so that we can take access of those touch points. And, and you know the reach and scope of those touch points are very important. Well, we need we need to have some um, extreme number crunching to do that. And so we look at um, AI to provide the auto discovery mechanisms to uncover any interactions that may be providing uplift to a particular conversion. And so you know if you're a marketer or a business person, just a few clicks, you can begin to track that touch point. Um, it's a discovery mechanism that we're able to put to the hands of, of every, put in the hands of everyone. Um, we have attribution models. Um, some of these are pretty straightforward. Um, the you know linear first touch, um, last touch, and AI driven model. Uh, the first three, we'll look at completed conversions, things that are known entities. Somebody has uh, you know, given us their information. They've downloaded the. Uh, the video, they downloaded the white paper. They've uh, you know, filled out that franchiser application. We know what they've done. But the AI-driven model is the one that's really kind of special. Now, a linear model looks at all the points in the customer journey, and it assigns equal portion to those. And it's useful for a multi-touch attribution model. The first-touch model weighs more heavily on that first interaction, which might be hitting a, a landing page for a seminar, for instance. And the last-touch model would be looking at the last interaction and weighing that more more heavily, you know, like filling out the franchise application in this case. But the AI-driven model utilizes a, a probabilistic approach. And what do I mean by that? Well, it assigns a strategic value to the touch points, um, giving us deeper insight into the interactions of our visitors, whether we expected it or not. It counts not only for the, the common path in that user journey, but, um, you know, those also accounts for the um, and accounts for and models the effect of non-converting assets, um, and it discounts frequently visited visited pages or actions. So, you know, those more predictable steps can be balanced out, and, and maybe they would be given a higher value in the other models. But the AI model is able to to put some um, 
really common sense behind, behind all that. And so when we look at those attribution models side by side, um, you can an understand better if you're valuing those touch points correctly. Uh, and you see in this slide, you've got an attributed value to um, each of those attribution models. And uh, this is a dollar value. It wouldn't have to be U.S. dollars. It could be another currency. It could be um, any unit of measurement that you want. But whatever is important for the particular business that you have. Um, and so, but how do we um, make other use of, of AI? So, you know, Safefinity Insight provides a notification service uh, that uses an AI anomaly detection um, service to monitor insight statistics for unexpected deviations. And um, they're reported daily through an email. Um, it points out exactly where the anomaly exists and allows someone who's even just a business user or a marketer to go right to that point and, and make the adjustments that might be required. And so that um, has some benefits really for the entire for the entire organization. Um, something else that we're able to achieve through this is this synthetic audience clustering. And this allows us to um, segment and cluster our audience in Sitefinity Insight, creating cohorts uh, that with those who have similar content consumption behaviors. And currently this is driven by the content classification and, and page titles that we collect. And by analyzing the, the conversion and touch points of each cluster, we can apply appropriate personalization initiatives, put those into place, and, and measure those. Now, it's also a highly integratable and extensible tool as well. Um, you know, insight data can be combined with other sources to create interactive dashboards and reports outside of even this insight environment. We can make use of available connectors with both Microsoft's Power BI and in Google Data Studio, and of course, we also have an API and, and SDKs that allow us to uh, make those connections as well. I'd like to take a little time to talk about some success stories where folks have used this. Now, Cambridge Innovation Institute has a lot of content. It's, it's, their business depends on it. They're, and, and their problem was that they didn't have a handle on it. They can't get rid of it. They need it, but they needed to have something like Insight to be able to stream like that, streamline that. Um, that had lots of value to them in a number of ways you can see on this slide. If you look at Swindon and Wilkshire, this is actually a UK public-private partnership. Um, and they needed to deal with their constituents and, and be able to personalize at a very high level. Well, they, they needed to do that through uh, something like this tool, which gave them ways to read and react to their constituents' interactions with the website. And I like it because it's not, it shows that we can use this not just for a very marketing or business type of application, but for even somebody that's a government entity. And legal in general, this, was, uh, this is an umbrella um, insurance company that was able to um, use Insight to, to gain understanding um, and, and over a, a, a multi-site implementation. Uh, need a lot of integrations. And ultimately, they were able to um, to use their technology and, and the technology that our partner um, helped them with to be able to um, have you know completely digital uh, applications and, and approvals. So um, that's a great great connectivity and um, and and, and uh, de siloing of of content in that story. So the benefits to your organization, well, those democratized AI services, being able to use other people's algorithms, as one of our developers says, uh, auto segmentation and being able to personalize on those segments. Uh, flexibility and attribution without IT reliance. Well, for the marketers in this group, that means that you can get a lot done without having to rely on IT as much. If you're an IT um, uh, worker in this audience, it means you can get out of the marketing business. Um, and then finally, automation for business decisions uh, through optimization recommendations and, and, uh, and the other aspects of, of what you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that, I will, uh, I will wrap that up. I think we have a, a survey at this point. Yeah, that's right, J.D. We have uh, three poll questions for everyone out there in the audience. Um, I've just brought up the first one on the screen that says, is AI and ML, or are AI and ML a key component to your digital experience 
initiatives? A simple yes or no. I'll leave that up while we you know, kick off our Q&A here. So uh, let's see, first question that came in, JD, they're asking, can Sitefinity Insight be used with websites hosted by other systems? Yeah, absolutely. So of course, uh, most the most seamless source for Sitefinity Insights tools is Sitefinity's own DXP. Um, we have a connector. We make it very easy to uh, to do that connection in a matter of minutes. But really, any website could be a data source, and you can set up specific data centers for those sources. Um, if you need to build a custom um, automated integration, uh, we can do that with our SDKs and REST API. Very nice. nice. I like that flexibility. Um, looks like kind of a 50-50 a breakdown here on this poll. So. Uh, interesting feedback. Thank you for everyone on that. Let me move on to the next poll. And this one is, are you looking to add or increase your application of AI and ML in your digital experiences initiative? So what's your, what's your time frame, you know, to leverage this kind of technology that you just learned about here? And so um, let's see, for Benjamin out there, if you don't see the survey, go ahead and just push refresh on your web browser and that will resolve it. Um, next question that came in, they're asking, how is Sitefinity Insight integrated with Microsoft Power BI and Google Data Studio? Yeah, so we have a partnership um, with Microsoft. And so for Power BI, um, you know, it works with the installed um, desktop client. You, know, you just generate an, an access key and then um, our Insight connector will expose the data in a star schema. Um, for, for we also have a Google Data Studio connector, and so you consume your Sitefinity Insight marketing data to create reports, right? And so you use an authorization token um, and a data center API key. Um, by the way, you can also benefit from Google services if uh, by collecting data via the, the Google Tag Manager. Excellent. Very nice. And thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll. Let's go on to our final poll for this session. Uh, and that's simply, you know, what additional information would you like about this solution that you just learned about? And so another question that came in here, JD, they're asking, uh, what about integrations? I, are, how are integrations done with Sitefinity DX? Right. So um, Sitefinity DX is a, a headless capable, uh, multiple API, highly integratable product. Um, it comes with some pre-built configurable connectors. Um, some examples are for Salesforce and Eloqua, uh, as well as the ones that I described in the last question. Um, you could do direct data import with those. Um, we can also every leverage um, our SDKs and our REST APIs. Um, for Insight, um, same thing. We can, we can pull data in from other, other sources that are set up as data sources. Um, you know, util utilizing all of that uh, you know, in a fully scalable and um, highly integratable way. Very nice. Very nice. And then I, I guess the integrations question kind of goes along um, with this question from Chris, who's asking, um, does does this solution have an API? Oh, yeah. Um, multiple APIs, connectors. We have a, a flourishing developer community and a marketplace where people are coming up with uh, – Great solutions all the time. In fact, today we have a hackathon going on, and I'm really excited to see what comes out of that. It's usually um, pretty exciting to see what our, our community can, can come up with. So, yep, lots of, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a product that was built, I think, because of our, our history as a software developer's developer. Um, our ease of use extends uh, to the developer environment as well. Um, you know, we... We, we aren't just trying to make it easier for business people with a whole lot of heavy lifting on the IT side. We have tools, and uh, it's a you know, .NET Core, um, Microsoft-specific, um, very flexible uh, community that, that's uh, integrating and building new things and, and creating great stories all the time. Excellent. Excellent. Let's see. Here's a good question from Ted who wants to know, uh, how do you estimate the economic value or the importance of implementing this type of solution? So, kind of the you know the return on on the investment. How, how you how do you gonna how do you know that this is going to be a right financial you know move for your company? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean we uh, we compete very well um, on a, a cost to value 
basis. Um, you hear that back all the time when we are, are reaching out to the analysts that you know we're we're a solution that you know, is the right fit for uh, for even some mid market companies. Um, and so we, we look at the investment and and you know we also um, you know we have a tiered solution. I'm not a salesman, so I'm not going to be able to give you specifics. But as far as the investment, um, we can right size it with the Azure deployment. Of course, you can you can scale it. Appropriately scaling up and down as, as your business needs um, require. Um, so uh, you know, it's a you know we try to make it easy entry. I think that was the question, um, or was it talking more about the value? How do we build the value for analytics? No, I think that was the question. Just uh, yeah, for, considering you know the value of the investment uh, for the company for the product. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. we we. Uh, yeah, all the things I said, you know, it's really a, it's a it's you know I'd, I'd love to be able to introduce you to one of our salespeople. We actually have the nicest salespeople I've ever encountered in this business, and uh, they can give you the details on that. Excellent. Yeah. So is that kind of the best way to get started? Is chat with a person uh, in sales and get a, a demo? Absolutely. So we've got a, a great sales engineering team, uh, some pretty brilliant people, and very knowledgeable sales force. That's uh, just loves to talk about uh, progress and, and our products. Awesome. All right. Well, JD, I'm afraid that's all the time we have here in our live Q&A. There's some more technical electronic questions for you there in the queue. Maybe you can respond to. But great presentation. Thank you so much for being on the EcoCast. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been terrific. And for more information on the Progress Solution, check out the handout that's available there in your audience console, console entitled Practical Applications of AI to Prioritize Your Digital Experience Platform. All right, if you haven't answered the poll, now is the time to do it. The next Amazon $500 gift card prize winner, this one is going out to Deverne Coleman from Kansas. Congratulations. And with that, I'm excited now to introduce you to our next presenter on today's EcoCast. Welcome, Sham Shinivasan, Senior Director and Head of Product Marketing at Trifacta. Sham, are you there? I'm here, Dave. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being on. Great to have you. Take it away. Great. Uh, thank you again, and uh, thank you to uh, everyone uh, for for taking the time to be here. It's, it's a pleasure, a privilege to be on this EcoCast uh, talking to all of you, and especially when, uh, when we're talking about a couple of my favorite topics, AI, ML, analytics, and of course, data. Uh, as I was joking with my family, it's like me, a kid in a candy shop, uh, talking about these topics, and uh, you know, uh, excited to be presenting Trifacta uh, to all of you and how you can harness the power of AI, ML. A uh, quick, uh, uh, quick round of the agenda topics. Uh, uh, I'll introduce myself uh, quickly, who I am, my background. Uh, of course, talk about who Trifacta is. And then we'll get to the core of the conversation. Uh, of course, the topic is about harnessing the power of AIML, but the foundation of AIML is data. And that's where Trifacta comes in. We'll talk a little bit about data, the foundation, and of course, the proof is in the pudding. And uh, I'll give you a sneak peek into Trifacta, and uh, we'll see what uh, the, the powerful solution is all about. Uh, about me, I, I lead product marketing here at Trifacta. I've been here for about uh, seven months now. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey, a great team here uh, across the board, across the cross-functional teams that we have. Uh, excited to be here. Uh, previously, uh, I used to lead uh, product marketing at AWS, uh, leading the machine learning function there. Uh, and, uh, and I've also led product management at AWS and uh, engineering at PM at Cisco, focusing on data center networking, IoT, among other things. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'd uh, love to connect uh, with all of you. Uh, you know, networking is uh, what I, I always excel at and uh, looking forward to it. So, uh, that's enough about me. Let's talk about uh, Trifacta. Uh, so Trifacta was uh, was formed uh, about nine years back in uh, 2012. Uh, it was formed uh, based on an academic research project between uh, three brilliant people 
at uh, UC Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, back in the day, uh, you know, the, it was a research project when these three brilliant guys thought that, hey, data is needed uh, for applications for analytics and insights, but raw data is never useful. So how can we transform the data, prepare the data to make it useful, right? Now, as the word got out, the concept caught on like wildfire, uh, and, and a lot of research uh, analysts, students, professors, and even industry folks started to use Trifactor to what they call as wrangle the data. And if you search the term wrangle today, uh, you, would, uh, you would definitely see Trifactor and top of your search results which is basically preparation of data and transforming it to make it usable. So we are talking about Trifacta at its inception and uh, how it caught on like wildfire, the concept of data preparation. And uh, the founders uh, soon realized that it is just not an academic problem. It is actually a business problem, right? A uh, lot of businesses needed usable, consumable data to get it from its raw format all the way to getting insights and analytics. Uh, so that's our history over the years. Uh, flash forward uh, where we are today. So today uh, we call ourselves as the data engineering cloud and I'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, data is just not about transformation. Uh, the evolution of data as a discipline has been tremendous over the years where you talk about different architectures with cloud computing and what we call as the modern data stack. Things have evolved. So Trifacta now actually addresses what I call as a data soup. There's a tons of terms out on the slide. I'm not gonna read each one of them, but the crux is that Trifacta can help you connect to different sources, both on-premises and on the cloud, ingest the data for you, transform it for you and get you to the right level of quality and for your AI ML applications and insights. So in summary, Trifacta is a data engineering cloud for analysts and machine learning enthusiasts for getting advanced insights for AI ML and for applications to harness the power of AI ML, which is the topic today. Just to round up, uh, so, uh, you know, we're grateful uh, for this journey. We address a multi-billion dollar market with the data engineering cloud. Uh, we have been called as a leader by lead analysts. Uh, tons of reports you can find on our website uh, for data engineering, for preparation, quality, and pipelining. We are fortunate that we have over 10,000 customers with over 100,000 users in those uh, enterprises, uh, public sector organizations, and our partners. Speaking of partners, I should talk about uh, one particular partner with whom we have a special relationship. Of course, we are on the cloud and we are integrated with all the leading cloud service providers, but we have a special relationship with Google. Uh, we pride ourselves as being the only partner of Google who are featured as a full-fledged service. Uh, Google brands Trifact as data prep on the Google Cloud Console. So if you go to the Google Cloud Console, you would see us and how we integrate with other Google services, their cloud data warehouse like BigQuery, uh, their AI ML solutions like Vertex AI and so on. And uh, along the journey, we have been uh, uh, you know, rewarded uh, considerably by analysts, industry experts, and uh, two things I wanna call out here uh, recently, we were awarded the best data-driven SaaS product at the 2021 SaaS Awards. And uh, at the G2 2021 Fall Reports, uh, we won a record eight awards for uh, various aspects of data. This is especially heartening and enlightening for us because this comes from user feedback and uh, end users who actually use Trifactor. So uh, thank you to all our uh, all our users, customers, partners, and so on. So uh, let, me, let me start the conversation now that I've established who Trifacta is with, uh, with an obvious statement. You would have heard this, the data is the difference. Now, what do I mean by this, right? Uh, what I mean is in today's world of cloud computing, all of us have access to tons of compute, tons of storage, uh, scale is never a problem today, especially with cloud. 
but what would differentiate you to make your applications, to make your AI ML solutions uh, different from others is the data that you would use in them. So that's why I call it as data is the difference. Now I will actually uh, substantiate this with why data and how you can get that differentiated data as we move along. The way I, I talk about it is, you know, make data work for you. What do I mean by that, right? Today, uh, data generation is, is unprecedented, right? Uh, some interesting facts I was reading about, by 2025, in less than four years, there will be more than 200 zettabytes, that's Z-E-T-T-A, double T, uh, and I was wondering what is a zettabyte. Uh, it said that a zettabyte is 1,000 times larger than an exabyte, and an exabyte is 1 million petabytes. Now, I would fail miserably if you ask me how many zeros they are. Perhaps my middle schooler son would help me out there, but that was mind-boggling for me. Uh, one more interesting fact about generation of data was at the beginning of 2020, about one and a half years back, the number of bytes in the digital universe was 40 times greater than the number of stars that you can observe in the universe. So what that number is, is anybody's guess, but the point is that data generation is at a massive growth. The sources are diverse. The data is disparate, considering the sources coming from all over the place. So how do you actually take this data for your analytics and harness it for your AI ML applications is usable data. And that's the foundation of Trifactor. Now, I said put data to work. That means you need to derive value out of data, right? Now, how do you, how do you derive uh, value out of data? Three simple uh, pillars is about making data as a business asset. What that means is that don't keep data as an independent entity. It's part of your business problem. It's part of your business solution. And of course, if you're looking at a technical solution, data sh is and should be part of it. The second important pillar, which is commonly talked about today, is about democratization of data. What do we mean by democratization? In simple terms, it means that the right people with the right level of permissions have access to data within the organization without bureaucratic gatekeeping or bottlenecks. The goal is to make it easy for people to access and understand the data so decision making can be expedited and opportunities can be uncovered for the business to grow. And of course, the end goal is always to drive insights and analytics, which is obtain the value of the data to grow your business, and most importantly, pursue areas of opportunity. If I were to summarize the three pillars, the goal is to transform your data, and in turn, transform your business as you go forward. Now let's come to the, to the topic of the day, right? About harnessing the power of AI ML with data. Now here, I'm gonna take the help of Gartner, who has put together a simple five-step formula of how you can drive efficiency with AI. It's not rocket science, it's a very simple formula, but it makes sense, and you'll see why. Now, Gartner says there's simply five dimensions to achieving AI efficiency in any organization you have to identify the right use case, right? Uh, it's not about using AI or ML for the sake of using it. It's about identifying the use case which makes sense, where you can harness the power of the application. You back it up with having skills with the right people. Of course, the foundation of the formula, according to me, is the data itself, because AI, ML is achievable only with the right data. And the last two points are obvious but need to be mentioned. You need to back it up with the right technology, and of course build the organization in the right method to support the AI efficiency that you deserve. But 
seems straightforward. There are certain uh, problems or hindrances to this, right? Again, quoting Gartner, there are some barriers to AI implementation. Out of the many barriers that you can talk about, I'm not going to talk about organizational barriers. Here, since we're talking about AI, ML, and data, the three top barriers to AI implementation are about the complexity, the quality, and the accessibility to data, right? You need to get over these barriers to achieve the level of AI efficiency which you, uh, which you desire for your organization. Now, what is the common thread here? It's the four-letter word data, where you need to have the right level of data, have access, and going back to my point about democratization of data, and break it down to level of simplicity and remove the complexity to get the high quality for your organization. Now, what, what people say is, hey, let's make organizations and decisions data-driven. What does that mean, right? Now, becoming data-driven is pretty much straightforward in a concept. What does it mean for a data practitioner, be it an engineer, a scientist, or an analyst, right? Uh, irrespective of the technical acumen. You have raw data in some form, somewhere. You need to connect to the data ingest it, which is just another term for onboarding the data, with, with the cloud you know, storage perhaps becomes easier. There is no limit to the scale. And then the core part of making the data usable is about profiling, preparing, and pipelining the data for analysis and for your end user application. Right? It seems pretty, pretty straightforward. Right? Go from point A to point B and so on and so forth. Right? But the reality is something else. Organizations and processes are never straightforward. They're never linear, the way I showed in my previous slide. Right? Now, if I were to break down any organization into two big buckets, right? obviously organizations have multiple teams, multiple aspects, but if we were to simplify it into two different teams, there is a central IT or central analytics team and there is, on the other end, is a line of business data teams. The struggle is always between these two teams. Technologies are different, priorities are different, and when you see the middle part of the profile prepared pipeline, it's an iterative, a straight, it's, you have to have new data, you have to update your existing data, and quality to analyze that. So here, uh, you know, I want to go back in time a little bit when Trifactor was, was formed in uh, 2012. Uh, at that point, uh, DJ Patil, who was serving as the chief data scientist of the United States uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy, had said that 80% of the time in any organization is spent in transforming data. You know, funnily enough, unfortunately, that is true even today even after nine years. If you talk to organizations, the time spent in making the data usable is nearly 80%, which is mind boggling. Now, why is it the case, right? So I talked about IT central analytics teams with different teams and different priorities, right? That's because if you look at the cell team, their priority is all about governance, reusability, and scale, right? They own the data, the, the right governance policy in place, and you have to scale it. On the other hand, if you look at the priorities of the line of business, it's all about self-service. You want to be, you want to be self-sufficient. You want to get to the market faster with the right tools. So the cracks are because of owns the data and the team who knows the data, and there's always a back and forth. Right? Now, how do you resolve this? Talk to Trifactor, where our goal is to remove the curve. We are the only open and interactive platform where you can use to collaboratively profile, prepare, and pipeline the data. And I'll talk about what I mean by profile, prepare, and pipeline in a bit. Right? The, the, 
goal is to collaborate between the two teams, right? Now, on the central analytics team, it's all about multi-cloud, where you should be able to be, you should be open enough to support any cloud ecosystem. Now, security is a stable state. It's priority number one, right? So you need to have the right security constructs in place. You need to have, you know, APIs, which are, which are table stakes in today's world, to embed into the modern data stack, which I alluded to earlier. And of course, with the right amount of cloud processing that you can do. On the other hand, when, I, when you talk about the line of business uh, teams, it's all about interactive, where you want to explore the data in real time. You want to be able to give your use, irrespective of the technical background, an ability to author transformations. For example, an analyst would want to have a, the right user interface giving you the transformation, whereas if I'm an engineer, I would love to code, bringing in my SQL script, my Python script, or whatever I would like to use. And bottom line is quality cannot be compromised similar to the security aspect. And ideally, I would like to have some reusable macros and templates. And that's where Trifacta addresses all these requirements. Dave, uh, if you don't mind, I would, uh, I would request you to uh, move the slide. I think I lost my internet access, but I can talk through the slides. I have the slides in front of me offline. If that's okay? Yes. Right. Yeah, we're on uh, Trifacta so, is the only open and interactive data engineering Yes, yeah. so that's what I talked about, about being open, being interactive, to profile, prepare, and apply your, uh, your data to get to your advanced analytics and insights. Now, I'll give you a sneak peek of what uh, the actual interface and how Trifactor operates. Dave, if you could uh, move to the next slide, please. Okay. So here, you can see I have a GIF running there where I'm talking about exploring and profiling data. What do I mean by profiling data, right? It's all about visually exploring and interacting with your data at its most basic level. What Trifactor gives you is an easy ability to connect to your data source, upload your data set, so that you can instantly understand the distribution of the data the patterns that the data analyzes, and of course, provide you with insights into mismatches or invalid entries so that you can give the right, you can act upon the right level of insights to correct the data, right? So profiling is all about qualifying the data, understanding it at its, at its very basic level, and then taking the right action to change the parameters with Next slide, please. Okay. Now, the other pillar is about data preparation and transformation. This has been our DNA since our inception, which I talked about earlier. What Trifacta provides you is the engine is powered by machine learning in the back end. What that means is that the engine is smart. It learns all the time of your data and what you're trying to do with the data. As an example, Date format is commonly misused across the world, right? In the US, we use as month, day, year. In Europe and in some parts of Asia, it's date, month, and year. So you would want to have a consistent methodology to understand that you want to have the right amount of data information embedded into your analytics. So what Trifecta helps you do is to give you a guided transformation automatically, give you a preview which you can absolutely take as is, or you have the choice to make your changes manually. So what that means is that you can standardize your data, structure and join data sets easily with a guided approach, and, and in summary, you can do your feature engineering with a single click, which makes it easy, seamless, and intuitive. If you go to the next slide, please, it's all about pipelining, right? What do I mean by a pipeline, right? A pipeline is a series of steps 
that you can do to take your data from its raw format, transform it, qualify it, assess it, and then you run your data pipelines to get the required insights. With Trifactor, it makes it easy to build, automate, and orchestrate your data pipelines, which helps you process your data at scale. With our rich connectivity library where we connect to over 180 sources, both on-premises and in the cloud, you can address all your applications, be it CRM applications, analytics, marketing analytics, and so on, to build these data pipelines. The easiness of building it is you can actually build it like a flowchart, like the way I'm showing it in the gift pair, where you can define your conditions of what success means, of what failure and perhaps the rerun means, and the conditions that you need to qualify a particular analysis as success. So as you can see, the rich interface of Trifecta allows you to completely get your raw data into usable format in a way that you can use it to harness the power of your AI and ML applications. So that's a sneak peek of Trifacta for you. To go to the next slide, please. You know, the, the proof is in the pudding. And, and uh, we are grateful and thankful to uh, our thousands of customers that we have across verticals. I have a, a, a small set of customers here who we are always grateful for. You see some prominent names here among the different verticals that I have and as well as the public sector. Our customers continue to uh, you know, guide us, use us for their AI ML applications, for their analytics, and that has kept us going as we grow from strength to strength. Next slide, please. So in summary, Trifactor is the data engineering cloud where you can harness the power of your AI ML applications, connecting to the cloud in a way that you want to, and getting the insights that is required for your business. We would love for you to try us. Uh, we have a free 30-day trial. Uh, the link is on the screen there where you can actually sign up for a free trial, play around the product, and use it uh, for your analytic needs. Uh, if you'd like a demo, we also have an option on our website where you can request a demo and somebody from the sales engineering team would love to talk to you and show you the So that was it for me and uh, happy to take any questions. Absolutely, yeah. We do have some questions for you from the audience. Um, while we do that, I'm just going to bring up a poll question for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about the Trifacta solution? And so let's see, first question here that came in, Sham, they're asking, um, at the start of your presentation, you mentioned, I believe you said $3 billion. Um, is that correct? And is that, uh, what, what can you give us in terms of more details on that? Sorry, $3 billion what? Uh, I said about we address a multi-billion uh, market uh, because of the different aspects of data. Is that what the question was uh, referring to? Yes, a reference to 3 billion people or customers. That's what the, uh, Ross was asking out here. Um, I don't know if I, if I misheard. It's about, uh, so we have over uh, 10,000 customers. Uh, I think the billion was mainly the addressable market size, which I, which I alluded to. Uh, so it's, a, it's you know, the, the, the numbers vary, right, depending on the analyst you talk about. Uh, so... Uh, from recent analyst research reports and our own uh, our own internal research, the the total addressable market is a multi-billion dollar market, where for data transformation, data quality, and data integration, and uh, that's where we uh, address the requirements for analytics. Got it. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Here's another question they're asking: Does Trifacta do any auto ML? Or there, are there any future plans to do any auto ML? Uh, well, uh, Trifactor has APIs to integrate into auto ML solutions like the way we do with uh, Google uh, Vertex AI, which I referred to earlier. So it's, it's not a feature of the product itself, but we have the plugins to integrate with Vertex AI and auto ML solutions where you can actually use the data to have 
uh, you know, drive auto ML models and train those models. Got it. Okay. Um, let's see. This interesting question from Paul. Given that Trifecta's automation capabilities could help leaner and agile teams, should smaller businesses uh, with potential or emerging use cases consider implementing Trifecta? So does this not only help the very large companies that you mentioned, but could this potentially help smaller or uh, smaller teams? Uh, the answer is a simple yes. I, I, I think, uh, you know, we've started with small teams. We have a, we have a lot of customers who are uh, with smaller teams, uh, you know, even less than uh, 50 people, uh, be it uh, an analyst, a team of analysts or a data team. Uh, so the answer is yes, because one thing which I kind of touched upon didn't dive deep is what I call a smart sampling. Uh, what smart sampling does is, irrespective of the size of the data, Trifecta actually gives you uh, it gives you the ability to sample the data and work on the data, right? So if you're a small team, absolutely would love for you to try. Uh, we have tons of customers uh, with small teams uh, who use Trifecta at the moment. Excellent. Uh, let's see. A question here: Does Trifecta provide the data analytics tools through web applications? So is this a web-based uh, solution? Yes, it is a web-based solution. So uh, pick your favorite browser, and uh, I know you can you can work on the workspaces within the browser. Uh, of course, as I said, uh, you know, irrespective of the cloud ecosystem that you are on, there's a Google and AWS and Azure. Uh, or, or even a Databricks or a Snowflake uh, integrated. So it is a web-based application. So there is no downloading required. Got it. Okay. Another question here, is there any limitation on the size of the data that you can use, and how does that impact the speed of the operations? Great question. Uh, no, the size of the data is not a limitation. Uh, you can go from as little as megabytes of data to petabytes of data. Uh, the difference is in the processing engine. What Trifecta gives you is a choice of processing engine. We have what we call as an in-memory processing engine for maybe some of your smaller uh, files, uh, which you may have. And of course, you can go to larger uh, processing engines, uh, be it you, know, you could use something like a Google Dataflow or an Amazon EMR, where you want to go from that megabytes to gigabytes or petabytes. So you have the choice of the processing engine that you want to use uh, you know, based on the size of your data and the complexity of your data. So that choice is yours. Got it. Yeah, I like that flexibility there. Um, another question, uh, what cloud ecosystems do you support? Uh, I mentioned this earlier. So uh, we uh, support uh, the three big players, uh, Google, AWS, and Azure. Uh, what that means is we are integrated within the ecosystem. I talked about uh, the special relationship with Google where uh, if you go to the list of services on the Google Cloud Console, you would see data prep by integrated there. We uh, with uh, and Snow warehouses uh, who in turn work on the AWS or Google or Azure ecosystems. Uh, so that openness and flexibility is for you to choose uh, whatever cloud ecosystem you are on today. Got it. Okay. Well, it uh, looks like, Sham, we're all out of time here in our live Q&A session. There's some more technical electronic questions there for you in the queue, perhaps you can get back to. But a uh, great presentation. Thank you so much for being on the EcoCast today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to, uh, to uh, be here. And uh, you know, I'll look at the Q&A panel. I'm looking forward to folks uh, trying Trifecta. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I encourage everyone to go out and check out uh, trifacta.com and uh, also check out the handouts tab. There is a link there to how to uh, transform your data and your business in six steps with Trifacta, the data engineering cloud. And in fact, let thank me go you. ahead and bring, thank you. Let me go ahead and bring up this slide. I'll just leave that up. That has the URL that you can click on right there to start your free trial with Trifecta and start wrangling. And I'll leave that up while I announce our final prize winner. This is going out to Nakia Grayson from Colorado. We have another Amazon $500 gift card. So congratulations to all three of our prize winners. I will post 
the prize winners' names there in the questions pane. And I encourage everyone to check out the link there to trifacta.com and start wrangling your data because we are moving on now to wrap up today's EcoCast. Uh, before you go, uh, of course, don't forget to check out the Gorilla Guide Book Club. You can find a link to that there in your handouts tab. And then at the end of the event today, we'll be automatically redirecting you to our event referral page where you and your IT friend or coworker could both win an Amazon $300 gift card. So don't forget about that. Um, if you are a potential sponsor of an upcoming Megacast or Ecocast event, uh, reach out to us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. And then finally, I hope to see you on next week's Megacast. It's going to be all about cloud tools, products, and services that are critical to cloud success. We're going to have some really cutting-edge, innovative companies on that event next week, happening next Wednesday on the 27th. I hope to see you there. I hope that you enjoyed today's EcoCast on harnessing the power of AI and ML to accelerate analytics, business, and IT operations. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.